Well, Dr. Griffith, as you know, we're developing a, an archives for the ISHLT in which we interview and have conversations with pioneers, leaders in the field, leaders in the society, and of course, you're one of those people. And we always have to ask some of the basic questions about what led you to pursue this very strange field in which you spend half of your time up operating at nights and, and doing unusual activities. Um, once you graduated from Jefferson Medical College and went to uh, did your training at Pittsburgh, when was it that the spark began? Uh, well, I think it all began with uh, that riveting uh, experience that a number of us of our age had as we were finishing high school and, and we awakened to hear about a heart transplant being performed uh, in 1960, what was it, 68, 60, 67. 67, then that big launch of 68 in Pittsburgh where I resided. Uh, Hank Bonson did the first uh, uh, regional one in 68. Um, that just seemed to me to be surreal and it, and it made me think very much about heart transplantation and, and about being involved in a field of that nature. So, so for me, I guess the seed was planted with that, that event and all that went around about it. It became clear as I went into uh, medicine that, that I really enjoyed cardiovascular physiology. And I worked my way um, early on at the University of Pittsburgh, where there really wasn't a thoracic transplant effort at the time. Really the only nascent examples of heart transplantation in the U.S. Uh, continued at, at uh, Stanford and Richmond. And so nobody really paid much attention to it. There were eight to ten patients done a year at Stanford, and you know it seemed to be a rather cloistered event and not very many people involved. And then I had gotten involved at... Uh, at the level of uh, the laboratory after three years in, in uh, general surgery. And my project in, in the uh, laboratory was to create an artificial placenta because I was really interested in premature babies and, and uh, lung disease, haline membrane disease, basically. It didn't seem to me to be at all fair that a baby should die of lung disease before it even took you know, 10 breaths. But um, So I had the hubris to match up with a lifelong now colleague, uh, Harvey Borovitz, who had just entered into the uh, Department of Surgery from a uh, postdoc fellowship at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And his project was uh, to design a low, low resistance drop membrane oxygenator, which at the time was quite revolutionary. We, we take for granted these marvelous oxygenators now that we all have to use uh, for long-term ECMO support and stuff. But when, when I started cardiac surgery, there was actually still the use of these uh, bubble oxygenators and, and not, even, not even membrane oxygenators. So it was a big advance and uh, we could use that membrane oxygenator, which was low resistance to blood flow, in a, in a arterial veno kind of a situation. So hooking up premature um, born uh, lambs uh, through their umbilical artery and vein to this oxygenator, we were able to, to, to really play with the concept of, you know, are we designing in, uh, in our artificial placenta, which remains an elusive dream, actually. But, but it did stimulate me to think about organ replacement. And then we were called to Children's Hospital to support a baby who had come in from Philadelphia over a Christmas holiday to, to see his grandparents and got an influenza of some type and uh, was on the ventilator and not being oxygenated or ventilated. And this little guy was uh, five years old. And I remember being asked, because of the work we were doing in the laboratory, um, to basically um, address the child with artificial oxygenation and respiratory um, advance using a mechanical pump and lung that we use basically in the operating room. But they thought we had some kind of magic. So we hooked them up to the old-fashioned Terumo oxygenator. And, um, and it was quite amazing um, just to see that whole thing play out as a young surgeon in training. And uh, so at the bedside for literally eight days, watching this baby actually have a long march to death. But in spite of our, quote, heroics at the time, um, you know, I could see the humanism of, of the loss of this child, the grandparents, the child's brothers and sisters came in at the, at the very end of it all. And it just seemed to me to be, you know, a nice place to work, you know, in this, in this area where so much needed to be done and so little was known. And so I just kind of said, 
if I'm going to work this hard, I want to do something perhaps that not everybody is doing, and um, so as to maybe learn something unique and then apply it. So I began to think about lung replacement and because of that case, but it was obvious that heart replacement was a little farther advanced. And so got into the heart transplant business in Pittsburgh when Dr. Bonson started it, Tom Starzl arrived. Now, what year would that have been? Um, Starzl came to Pittsburgh in 81. I joined the faculty in 80 at Cyclosporin to introduce. Uh, so it was just on that cusp of that, uh, that massive era, the, the dawn of that era with the uh, introduction of cyclosporin. Yeah, I mean, I hit it just at a time where, where we were just thinking about emerging from the non-cyclosporin-based therapies where a 50% outcome was really pretty good at a year. And so all of a sudden, um, when Tom Starzl came to Pittsburgh, even though we had started transplantation with conventional immune suppression the year before, Dr. Starzl arriving with this powerful new drug that very few people knew anything about, actually. Um, it was being introduced in cardiac transplantation at Stanford and uniquely in Pittsburgh. So here was a real rookie team, literally reading the, the How to Do It books, you know, introducing this important immune suppressant. But that immune suppressant even the field and uh, gave even the upstarts uh, major advances in terms of the outcomes. And none of us understood the drug very well. We would look at biopsies. We had no blood levels to follow. We didn't understand why patients were going into renal failure. You know, we would just dose them. But it was such a powerful differentiator that I think it made the field and certainly made it a lot easier for most of us who hadn't spent our whole life studying, you know, the effects of, of azathioprine-based immune suppression um, to get into the field with some positive reinforcement. We didn't have to go through those dark days that have been chronicled very nicely by this medium where so many people passed, you know, in spite of the best efforts of so many. So, Bart, about this time, Bruce Wrights, of course, uh, proceeded with his historic heart-lung transplantation, and you were really right on his heels. Uh -huh. And so tell us about that time and, and uh, how the experience at Stanford stimulated or competed with your experience at Pittsburgh. Ah, well, number one, you have to know Bruce, you know, and Bruce is such a gentleman and a giver, you know. So the day after Bruce announced he had done it, I was on the flight to Palo Alto to see how he had done it. And he was so gracious about that whole era, you know, in terms of educating others. It was quite a surgical feat at the time, and uh, just to think about it was, you know, a little bit beyond uh, what anybody else um, could imagine. But he did it with such a plum, you know, and uh, it was unfair to call him a mentor because he was too close contemporarily. But but the path he had chosen was so spectacular, and he handled it with such a, an ease. Uh, it was it was great to follow him. So he he educated, and then. We had this idea, of course, that maybe we could fly for donors. Remember, Jim, though, that was a time when, when donors were actually moved to the, to the recipient hospital. Can you imagine? Um, it started, of course, in cardiac uh, donation, but then with the lung, there didn't appear to be anybody who had confidence that you could adequately store lung ex vivo for any amount of time at all. So the original heart-lung transplant series at Stanford uh, was, was confounded by the need to bring donors into the hospital. Um, so we had this idea that we, we could learn how to maybe do that better and, and bring donors in, in boxes and as opposed to, you know, hospital beds. So, so that helped me take off and distinguish, I guess, what we were doing in Pittsburgh from what might have been going on elsewhere and when we began to fly for organs. How long after his heart-lung transplant did you perform a clinical operation. Uh, I don't know. I think it was within the same year or very soon thereafter. And I think no one else had done it other than Stanford before you did your first heart lung transplant successfully. No, Magni Yacoub picked up very quickly and ran a big series um, and really outdistanced everybody within a couple years of that. But, but at the time, yeah, I think we were one of the very few. And I, was, I must say, as a, as a very young surgeon in the field at the time as well, um, like many of us, I had had no training in transplantation. It was all about, in other areas of cardiac surgery, transplantation didn't exist. And then within one year of completing my training, uh, the cyclosporin era was upon us, and there were enough of us 
that were fascinated by the possibility of transplantation that, uh, uh, that we became involved. And I very, very poignantly remember uh, visiting you and Bob Hardesty yep. uh, during the very early days in Pittsburgh to see the box. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it was really quite inspirational for all of us because it was very, very clear that it was not going to work to have to bring every donor hundreds or maybe thousands of miles to a hospital to do a heart lung transplant. Right. Um, I remember your visit and you were kind to come. And, um, and it was at a time when we had just established the ability to, in essence, bring back a beating heart, ventilating lung, autoperfusing block um, in a big kind of aquarium, if you wish. Um, it was a heroic explant procedure that only a skilled surgeon like Bob Hardesty could do on a regular basis. And uh, it did require a timing uh, on the explant such that the minute the organ arrived, uh, it had to be implanted because we didn't have the confidence that, that an autoperfusing block could last more than about six or eight hours before it became edematous and, and things of that nature. So, so it was really kind of a scary time. There are some funny vignettes about all that. Uh, Bob Hardesty on one occasion we're right in the middle of an explant. He's flying back, and we get this message: stop. Well, you know, because the timing was so crucial, and it took a while to explant at the, at in those days, uh, heart lungs. We were right in the middle of removing, I think, the second lung, so there wasn't any stop, stop. And then the next message was uh, send blood to the airport. And of course, what had happened was, and unknowingly, and we sent a liter of blood from the bypass machine. And met Bob Hardesty and the team at the airport and they were able to retransfuse the autoperfusing heart and lung because one of the bronchial arteries had gotten loose uh, in the airline you know in the, in the uh, uh, transportation and and so that the level of the autoperfusion was was dropping and the, the whole thing had to be retransfused and it was only a couple days later did i learn that a very pale bob hardesty had basically auto transfused the machine and laying down in the back of the air, oh. airline taking blood out of himself and Bob's an O blood. Uh, so he put that into the reservoir just to get this machine, if you wish, this auto perfusing heart lung, heart lung block back to the airport so that it could be met with yet another liter of blood from our, our patient. But it was that kind of do what's ever necessary, you know, that I think made it made all the difference. It made it fun. It made it exciting. It made some difference to patients, I'm sure. Um, you know, there wasn't really an FDA officer meeting us anywhere. We just did what we thought was right for patients. And as long as the university thought it was a good idea, it was kind of be brave and forge on. So in the midst of all this, at some point, um, you became interested in support techniques, uh, mechanical support techniques. Take us through the little bit the era in what you what stimulated to put so much energy into these other systems i don't know why it just seemed like the thing to do i have a little bit of a an engineering background and and so um even back in that era uh, we thought that sometimes patients wouldn't wait and you know like a 10-day wait for an uh, organ in an acutely ill patient seemed like a long time and a number of patients died we didn't have the same ability to keep people alive because we didn't have VADs. So a young person would come in with a bad cardiomyopathy and be dead in 10 days and you wouldn't ever get the organ. So it did appear that, uh, I guess because I was working on an artificial lung at one point or an artificial placenta, that it seemed to make sense to continue and do the more simple thing, which is just get involved in pump development or align oneself with those that were. And uh, again, with, uh, uh, I think, uh, Jack Copeland's uh, uh, implantation of, of the total heart and uh, precedingly the work uh, in Utah, you know, that, that made all of us sit up and think that, well, maybe this is the way. Uh, the total heart had not established itself as a vehicle for long-term running, if you wish. We thought that it might not be ready for destination, if you wish, but surely it could keep people going for two weeks before the roof fell in on them. And uh, I think that stimulated me to get the team out to Utah and... Uh, get trained up and very soon after Jack had, had implanted the first uh, heart as a bridge to transplant um, in Arizona, um, uh, we, we did a similar kind of a procedure in Pittsburgh. In fact, our patient was able to complete the whole 
trilogy, which was implant, home, and then back again for the transplant um, before Jack's patient even had his transplant. So, so we were right on the heels of that one too, and it was so much fun to be involved at that level. And did you develop a relationship with Jarvik at some point during this? Sure. Well, during that whole period, of course, Rob Jarvik was a superstar at the time, and uh, you know he was you know the Barney Clark era, and you know that whole thing was really kind of wow, this is pretty cool. You know, we we had great hubris. You know, we didn't think that it was going to take us another thirty years to get it right. Of course, uh, we thought we were going to be all right, and maybe maybe this was the answer. You know, the NIH thought it was the answer, right? They had invested for 20 years to get us to Barney Clark. Um, so here we are with 50 years of investment. We're still at this meeting today talking about all kinds of necessary uh, accoutrements to mechanical support uh, to get us where we need to go. But again, uh, everything is in place in time. And at that time, it was just amazing to think that not only could you transplant a heart, but now you could replace it with plastic, you know. So how can you not be drawn into that? If you have any sense of interest in, in helping people and the critical order in the heart, if you have a vehicle to replace it with that's not biologic and, and that has the potential of working, how can you not be passionate about being involved in that? And of course, it was fantastic. And there were all these secondary gains, of course, because you kind of get this feeling that in spite of the fact you're losing your hair, you know, because you're not sleeping and, and uh, you know, you're working day and night, um, you, you are benefiting by that, you know, secondary gain of, of being involved in this. And, and people think you're a really big deal, you know. And here I was, very young, very, very young, you know, at age 32 or 33, representing the vanguard of surgeons, you know, who were permitted to play with this very important technology. So, I mean, it was humbling, and yet it, there was a little false... Um, face about it too because it made me feel like I was probably more important than I was at the time and that stimulates one you know it's kind of nice to have that push you know like hey this is pretty neat and take us through your role in the Jarvik 2000 yeah Jarvik 2000 that cute little pump that I continue to use um, well uh, Rob as you know Rob um, uh, disengaged from the total heart uh, uh, through a uh, uh, a situation which was more business oriented. So Rob, uh, in his rebound, uh, said that maybe he could create a better widget, and he came up with this little tiny egg-shaped uh, ventricular assist device, rather unique at the time. And it disappeared into the left ventricle, so there was no inflow cannula at all. And some of the early VADs were plagued by inflow cannula difficulties. And so Rob just said, I'll just, in his brilliance, he just said, I'll just eliminate it. And so it seemed to me that it'd uh, be pretty neat to continue to align oneself with that genius and uh, just see what he has in mind. And so I became one of his uh, uh, clinical proponents, if you wish, and, and users. And I know Bud Frazier was very much involved with the early Jarvik work as well and probably had the largest single experience uh, uh, during that first introduction of it. But we've continued to work with Rob and it's paid secondary gains as well because uh, we've had a number of nice NIH-based contracts to help evolve that device now, even for infants. And, um, there's a contract currently that we're finishing and prepared to go to IDE in the next few months with a really tiny little pencil thin ventricular assist device, you know, designed for infants. Uh, so being able to see the whole evolution with a creative genius, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. I must say, uh, as I review your career, I'm quite struck by a, a couple of things. One is that so many surgeons, you know, that I have personal interactions with have some good ideas, some better than others, but, but the discipline to translate that into the written word and, and publish uh, in a disciplined manner is, is in some ways becoming less common. And you're a shining example of uh, unbelievable productivity. Uh, uh, I don't know, over 500 original publications uh, uh, in, in a focused manner over 30 years or more. Um, tell us about that. What's your, how do you do it? Uh, is it important? Uh, what's the stimulus? How does one uh, create the discipline and the drive to do that over such a sustained period. Yeah, well I can still remember the first time I got my first galley proof back. It was like, well this is wonderful. You know, these are words that I've written and here it is in a, you know, in a galley and you 
I mean, that was, I could have been, uh, could have been Dr. Kirkland himself, you know, who had, had accepted a paper. I mean, that was, as a young person in the laboratory, that's when that happened, I think, or maybe even pre-laboratory for me, but it always appeared to be uh, important, if you have something to say, to write it down, because nobody, you don't have any audience otherwise, you know, and so, so there was a certain amount of discipline um, through my laboratory experience that this was the way to do it, and it was part of my training to do it that way. Um, and, and if you have the great privilege of, of being around um, new science and new application of science, you, you, you owe that privilege at the very least um, its due, which is to then communicate how it came out yeah, so that others, number one, can be aware of your experience, number two, don't have to repeat your mistakes, and number three, can take that platform and advance it. So I think it's a duty, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's important. What about the idea of impatience with others? Um, you've been one that's been known to uh, have unusual ideas, uh, prescient in some ways about what might be happening in the field. Um, as I viewed you from uh, not only as a friend but also as a, as a professional colleague, it's been apparent and when there are interesting things happening, even from the beginning with the preservation box to the application of interesting devices. If there's interesting things happening, look to Pittsburgh uh, or look to Maryland. And um, it has often been mentioned about you that your intellect of, uh, is, of course, very sharp, but you tend to look at in areas where others are perhaps always not so interested. Do you ever get a sense of impatience in others that, not being able to see the vision and move ahead with the alacrity that you would like? Mm. That's a really probing question. I, I think that if there's any impatience, it's with myself, um, not being able to move the ball forward and not with others. You know, one can be frustrated about the regulatory environment that we're in and watching great technology you'd love to be helping to pioneer and patients go elsewhere. Uh, I think that's, I'm impatient with that problem. You know, it's hard to innovate in the laboratory a device and then watch somebody else implant it simply because of regulatory burden, burdens, you know, in the U.S. that make it difficult. Um, but having said that, uh, I don't know, Jim, I, I like to go to meetings and I, I'm kind of not really listening to the talk. I'm kind of listening to the concept of the talk and trying to figure out maybe how that talk really affects the future and, and what, how that will stimulate me to do something about it. Uh, I, I love to come to meetings not so often but frequently enough that, that I'm stimulated. You know, a meeting is a wonderful event, you know, it's a social opportunity, but these young people that come to these meetings, they've got it, you know. They may not understand that they've got it, but they've got this great idea, and, and if you can mate that idea with, with uh, hard-earned experience, the, the combination is like a firestorm. Do you have any sense of pessimism about where the field is going, or no? No. I don't have any pessimism. All you have to do is, is look at the bright people that are involved that, uh, quite frankly, are better operators, keener intellects, and, and have more tools than you and I had, you know. Um, I think we're in great shape. Um, we're going to cure heart disease one time, but on the way, there are going to be people like us that are going to make meaningful differences to people who can't be cured by replacement strategies. I, I'm confident of that. And when you, when you deal with young residents and uh, young cardiac surgeons in the field. What's the general attitude, not only by your words, but by how you live your life, that, that you try to communicate to them to see if you can get them to find that spark which will, which will lead to a, at least a decade and potentially a lifelong commitment? Yeah, I've been a program director now for 25 years in terms of residency. And and it's really important to me. Um, of course, a lot of what you produce depends on what you take in, but you do have the ability, I think, to demonstrate what's important in life to your trainees. And um, I have this wonderful um, opportunity to lead a group of people as a division chief who have had a fairly well-rounded 
life, and that's important. So you set the standard of you know matrimonial bliss and the importance of, about committing not only to your profession but to your personal life and to your kids and all that stuff. And then in the middle of that, you commit to your patients. You know, and uh, I, I spend a lot of time at the bedside now with patients, and uh, in, in my education uh, of a trainee extends clearly out of the operating room to the bedside, and and um, this. This compassion that we have has to be in evidence to the patient and um, holding their hand on rounds. You know, I know that we're not supposed to touch patients. We transmit disease, so I'm careful with the alcohol now. But, but you come in and hold a patient's hand and it makes all the difference to the patient. Their fear goes away. Uh, you actually can tell whether that hand's warm or cold and what the pulse rate is. You learn a lot on the physical exam just from doing that. But five minutes of your day with that patient that has given you the opportunity to operate on them and maybe take their heart out even, um, seems to me to be a not very big price for you to have to pay. And if you can't translate that compassion and that need um, to your trainees, then I don't think there's any hope for us. So, you know, if there's any pessimism, it would be if we have people that are unfeeling. And fortunately, I see lots of young people that are very feeling. And uh, I think cardiac surgery in general is going to go through a kind of a resurgence, uh, kind of like a Marine. It will take a few good people and uh, they'll continue uh, what so many others started long, long ago. Bart, thanks very much. It's You're been welcome. a great pleasure. My pleasure.